Reed. I want to welcome you to the B-Side Tampa 2015. Brought to you by your local IAC Squared chapter, um, of which, uh, if you're not a member, you should seriously, seriously consider being a member. Right? It's really cool. All right. Um, so, our next topic is uh, security in the cloud. All right? Um, we all know about the cloud. Um, we all love the cloud. We all use the cloud, whether you know it or not. Well, if you're using smartphones and stuff and all that stuff. But um, what most of us don't have any idea about is uh, um, how our, you know, our, our data is being secured in the, in, the, in the cloud and all that stuff. So, um, our next speaker is going to shed some light on all this stuff for us. Right? And it's going to be some exciting stuff. So, our next speaker is um, Alan Zakowski. Um, Alan is a principal consultant uh, with Positech LLC, and he has over 20 um, years of uh, information security experience, working with uh, a number of different organizations such as the U.S. Army, Citizens Property Insurance, Royal Bank of Scotland, IC Squared, yeah, um, Ocean Bank, and uh, many others. Um, Alan also has a master's in business, business administration, he holds certifications on CISSP, um, CISA, CISM, P um, PMP, CSM, CSPO, and ITIL. Um, Alan is also a member of the Scrum Alliance and the uh, Cloud Security Group. Um, today, uh, Alan will be discussing a wide variety of cloud security issues, including uh, architectural framework, governance, risk management, and encryption. Exciting stuff. I mean, I'm excited. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alan Zakowski. Can you hear me now? All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. I'm going to set my water down. You know, I, I don't want to mess up this computer, so I'll, I'll set it right here by the socket. That seems safer. All right. So, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit here about uh, the cloud. So, who has had this type of situation? You're doing your information security stuff, and you want to do a test, or you want to look at a particular application, and they say, oh, don't worry about it. We're going to migrate that to the cloud next week. In fact, anyone? Just me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, why did they do that? And why weren't you consulted? And what do we need to do in regard to security in the cloud? That's kind of what we're going to talk about here. We're not going to get too far into technical um, aspects of the cloud, private cloud, or hypervisor hardening, or any of that other stuff, although we will discuss a little bit. So let me figure out which one of these I need to use. Anyone? Anyone? Which one of these clicks the? That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, just do, we'll do this one. All right. So what is the cloud? And we're going to use uh, NIST definition. Actually, I appreciate that, because if this doesn't go well, I can slip out and no one will know. All right. Uh, according to NIST, uh, cloud computing is a model of, for enabling ubiquitous, there's a word for you, uh, convenient on-demand networking, network access, to a shared pool of configurable computing resources, network, servers, storage, applications, and services that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider integration. That's why it's attractive. We'll talk about a little bit more about why cloud is attractive. All right, so I got to walk. All right. So this is the model from NIST. And if you look here, and you really can't see it all that well, but you'll see the um, essential characteristics of the cloud. Broad access, rapid elasticity, measured service, on-demand service, and resource pooling. And then you have the delivery models. Software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. You also have things like security as a service now, uh, as somebody from Collis will tell you outside. Um, 
Then you get into the deployment models. Public, private, hybrid, and community. So let's talk about this for a little bit. What's a public cloud? If you're using virtual machines, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. If you're out there and you're using a public cloud, you're using things like Azure. Um, a private cloud would be, if you're virtualizing any machines, you basically are running a private cloud. A hybrid, a hybrid might be where you have a private cloud, but you cloud burst into a public cloud at peak times of the season. So in other words, if you're running some sort of business that's online and you know that there's a peak time in Christmas time for your website and there's a lot of traffic and you don't want to pay for that bandwidth all year round, you can cloud burst. Meaning you basically contract with a service provider that in November you start buying up and using up some of their bandwidth. Okay? And community clouds which are, um, well, actually, we're going to get into that just a little bit later. Let's, let's not jump ahead. Um, so software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. And infrastructure as a service is basically um, anything below the OS. So I need some servers. And so anyone can come up with a company or start a company pretty much uh, with a credit card and access to Azure. So you can basically create your own infrastructure as a service. Platform as a service, uh, OS, up to the OS, including the OS, and you put your own software on there. And then there's software as a service, which is really popular right now. This is basically, we'll do it for you, you just give us the data and we'll house everything. All right, so here are the cloud benefits. They're on-demand self-service, broad network access, resource pooling, the rapid elasticity, the measured service, this is the key. This is the one that management goes for. Anyone here an accountant? Anyone, anyone? All right, can you tell us the difference between CapEx and OpEx? Right, I can take what I'm spending in capital expenditure and now make it operational. On the books, that looks very good. And that's why, from an accounting standpoint, management likes to use the cloud. They say, well, if I put it in the cloud, I'm no longer expending capital expenses. I can operationalize it. Why? Because I'm paying a fee. It's a reoccurring fee, and it's not hardware. It's not things that have to be um, depreciated. That's the word. <laughs> So we talked a little bit about this already. Platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, and this definition is from NIST, um, which is one of the uh, standards that I used when I put together this presentation. I'll mention some other ones as well, including the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, so the applications are accessible from various client devices through thin client interfaces such as web browsers. So why is that important? Well, any vulnerability that you have with a web browser, you now have with this. Platform as a service, the capacity is provided to the customer to deploy onto the cloud infrastructure customer created or acquired applications creating using programming languages and tools supported by the provider. Okay. and infrastructure as a service. Capability provided to the customer is a provision processing, storage, network, and other fundamental commuting resource, computer resources where the consumer is able to deploy and run arbitrary software which can be included operating systems, applications, and that sort of thing. Why is this all important? Know what you're buying. So management comes to you and they say, we're gonna put this in the cloud. What does that mean? I had this conversation with a client one time and they said, well, we're thinking about cloud services. And I said, what? Well, we're going to put it in the cloud. What does that mean? Well, we're going to stick it in the cloud. Okay, you're going to do an infrastructure as a service, software as a service, platform as a service. What, what are you doing? And then their IT people are sitting there going, we already have a cloud. Because they're talking about their private cloud, their, virtual, uh, their virtualized uh, machines. Which management wasn't even aware that that was considered a cloud. So we talked a little bit about this already. 
private cloud, and this is what we were talking about, where you basically run your own virtualized machine within your system. It could be on-premises, it could be in a colo. This is shared by several organizations. So basically, if you're a law enforcement organization, and I'm dealing with this now, and you have to deal with CGIS data, okay, which is uh, criminal justice data, there are groups that are putting together basically clouds that are only for law enforcement, only for CGIS data. That way they can become compliant with those, requ with those requirements which are put out by the FBI and all be compliant together and kind of share the costs of that compliance. And this is the public cloud, to the, made available to the general public. Large industry groups are owned by organizations selling cloud services. This is important because, honestly, there are a lot of cloud providers out there that will tell you that we sell stuff to the government, therefore we are safe, okay? It happens. And you go, okay, what did you sell the government? That's the question they don't want you to ask because the reality is what they sold the government is very different from what they're selling you. Do they sell stuff to the government? Yes, in a community cloud that is restricted to only government assets and only government data. But is that what you're buying? Make sure if that's what's required. And we talked about this a little bit. This is the, uh, the ability to basically cloud burst. So who are the actors in regard to cloud? And I'm not gonna get too much into this. This is the cloud consumer, which is the people that are buying it. The cloud provider, the people providing it. The cloud auditor. This is important uh, in that if you decide that your assets need to be protected because they are HIPAA data, PCI or some sort of other protected class, getting a cloud auditor to audit the security as a third party might be an option. A cloud broker. Now a cloud broker is somebody who puts together a series or a package of other cloud providers and basically sells you the whole thing. Or you can go to a cloud broker and say, hey, I need a solution that does this, this, and this, make that happen. And then they can put together a package and come to you and go, well, this data is going to be over here, the processing is going to be over there, your backup is going to be over here, your application is going to be over there, but they're all under one contract. And the cloud carrier, an intermediary that provides connectivity and transports of cloud services from cloud providers to cloud consumers. Any questions so far on, on this stuff? Comments, manifestos, nothing? All right. I'm sorry? Cloud broker, an entity that manages the use and performance delivery of the cloud services and negotiates relationships between cloud providers and cloud consumers. So that's that intermediary we were talking about. I'm sorry? NIST is moving off of that to use. Oh, well, you know, that's the nice thing about this is that we don't have this all cemented in yet. So these standards that are coming out um, are coming out, I think uh, one of the standards came out was last, from NIST, the final version was last July. So this is uh, cutting edge. The funny thing about that is I work with a, a few government agencies that have been in the cloud for a year now or two years now because they thought it was great and now they're like, oh wait, maybe not so much. All right, so these are some of the responsibilities. You know, uh, with the software as a service, user application, the consumer activities are uses application service for business processes and operations. The provider installs, manages, and supports the software. Anybody see any issues with that? Anybody had to put in a ticket to have something changed with a, with a cloud provider? I'm sorry? We, this isn't where I listen.
So that's a software as a service because they basically provide everything and you put the stuff up in there. So their application is uh, basically handling you know, the storage of your, your items. Office 365 is a software as a service and it's really big and it's gaining a lot of steam. It's gaining a lot of steam with government agencies because they're actually starting to market themselves as secure to CGIS level and that sort of thing. So the platform as a service uh, develops, tests, deploy. This is the customer and manages the hosted application in the cloud environment. Provisions, uh, the, uh, or, I'm sorry, the provider provisions, manages the cloud infrastructure, middleware, platform. Customers provide development and deployment. Uh, infrastructure as a service, basically the customer does everything other than the box and the providers uh, provision the physical processing, storage, networking, and hosting environment in the cloud infrastructure. All right, so this is from the Cloud Security uh, Alliance, and this is the combined con conventional, or I'm sorry, conceptual reference. And you can stare at that a while and try to wrap your mind around it. It makes me kind of dizzy. So what are the risks with the cloud? Well, you have a couple things. You have vendor risk, okay? Um, a lot of organizations, uh, the thing with the cloud is that anyone can basically, like we talked about before, anyone can become a cloud software as a service. All I need is a credit card in about 45 minutes and I can go onto Azure, basically create an entire network, load my software to it and sell it. And come to you and say, I have this great application, all right? And I'm gonna jump around a little bit here because um, when you start talking about vendor risk, what are you really talking about? One, is that vendor gonna be in business next year? So this is where we start to step outside of security and this is where the paradigm starts to shift and why the cloud is so different. Because you've been dealing with infrastructure, you've been dealing with applications in regard to security, now you are no longer those people. You are a vendor manager. And that's the paradigm that you have to overcome because now you're just managing to SLAs, but before you get, even get to that point, you have to start looking at who you're doing business with. Are they financially stable? Did they start yesterday? And depending on your risk appetite, that might be okay. But if it's not, you need to be aware of this, okay? Also, who else is involved with their solution? I was dealing with one client and they said, hey, we got this great thing, it's gonna save us millions. It's just ridiculously cheap. We couldn't believe how cheap this application was. And I said, great, that's awesome. Who are you dealing with? Well, this company, they're relatively new, but we're okay with that. And they're going to uh, migrate all our data, social security numbers, the whole get up, uh, onto their cloud solution. All right, you mind if I take a look? Sure, go ahead. All right, so the software as a service was one layer of the abstraction. They were on a platform as a service that they were contracted with, and that platform was on an infrastructure as a service that they were contracted with. Where's your data? What happens if the software company that literally started up last year goes under? They don't pay their bills. Where's your data? Are you gonna contact the platform as a service? You're gonna contact the infrastructure as a service and they're gonna say, who are you? We don't have a contract with you. We have no contractual obligation to give you anything. And oh, by the way, we just went ahead and took all your databases and repurposed them and we didn't really wipe any of the data because we don't really do that. We're not contractually required to. So, it might still be there, maybe. Hopefully they overwrite it, but maybe not. Multi-tenancy. So you're on a software as a service that's on a platform as a service, and you're on there uh, with a whole bunch of other people. 
and maybe you're logically seg segregated, maybe the service doesn't require logical separation, so you're not, and you're all in the same database. How safe are those people, do you know? But by the way, this should have been scare the crap out of everybody um, talk. <laughs> Potential loss of command and control of data. Again, where is it? E-discovery. This is one that people don't really think about. What happens if tomorrow your company is sued and they say, give us all your data? You have a court order. Please provide this in a raw format. And you go to your software as a service and they go, we don't do that. You're on a multi-tenancy box. Legally, we can't do that because that would expose other customers' data that have nothing to do with you. So we can't give you that. Our, our legal is telling us not to give you that. So you have to turn around and go to the court and the judge and say, I know you have an order, but they're not playing and they won't give it to us. So now what are you going to do? Or the software as a service says, yeah, we can go ahead and give you that, but the court order actually requires everything on that server. And that's an infrastructure or a platform as a service, and, and those people, they, they're saying no. So e-discovery is very difficult, and you need to get your legal department involved, because I bet you any money that when the project manager or whoever, the BA or the business unit that sold this to senior management did not talk to legal in regard to e-discovery. DRBCP, what is their DR plan? I literally, and I'm gonna tell you a horror story here, I was talking to a gentleman who basically had a company, I was talking to the sales rep, and we were doing kind of a risk assessment, vendor management risk assessment, and I said to them, what are your practices in regard to DRBCP? And I kid you not, I couldn't make this up. The CEO was on the line and he says to me, what does that mean? And I said, disaster recovery, business continuity plan. And he said, oh, oh, okay, yeah. I'm learning about that now. I guess that if the platform were to go down, we have a version here locally in dev that we could just move to a server under my desk and point everything to it if we were required to do that. That is a true story, I kid you not, this is what the guy said. And I could almost hear the sales guy swallow his own tongue. Because he was telling how great everything was, and the CEO just kind of let everything out of the bag. So other, we'll talk about those. So the first thing you need to know, or need to get involved with in regard to cloud security and you know, moving your stuff to the cloud is data classification. What type of data are you going to be moving to the cloud? Are you able to move it to the cloud securely? Are there legal requirements in regard to that data that you have to be aware of? Is the provider prepared to deal with those legal requirements? Are they written into SLAs? Because if they don't, that's a problem. Data diagram, data flows. In other words, know your own business and business process flows. Know your own business before you try to pawn it off on somebody else. Because if you don't know what you're putting in the cloud, they're not going to know. And once they got it, they're not going to deal with it correctly because chances are you might not have been dealing with it correctly. Is there a case to be made to move it to the cloud because it might be more secure? Absolutely. You've been in environments, probably some of you, where you said internally, we are a wreck and it might actually be better if we could build a good contract and put it out there. Risk assessments. What is the risk of moving this information to the cloud? Again, back to vendor management and the vendor assessment, along with your contractual requirements with your customers, your legal requirements with compliance, PCI, GLBA, um, HIPAA, IRS data, CGIS, the list goes on and on. NERC. Responsibility and accountability. This is very important, and this is something you need to drive home to your management because they do not understand this. But your legal team does. 
You can outsource infrastructure. You can outsource functions. You can only outsource some responsibility, and you cannot outsource accountability. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot. If you don't believe me, go home and ask your legal team. How many people know the name of the vendor that actually injected the vulnerability into Target? Nobody. Who was accountable? Target. The other example of that is, and, and just as legal precedence, the BP oil spill. Halliburton poured the base. Remember when BP tried to go after Halliburton? And the judge said, oh no, you wrote the specs. This was your job. Same thing. You put this stuff into the cloud. The responsibility for managing it might reside somewhat in the cloud, but you're going to have to manage it. And the accountability overall is the company that you work for. You cannot throw this over the fence. And too often you get with managers and go, you know what, we can't deal with the security thing. You deal with it. Doesn't work that way. So we talked a little bit about this already, vendor viability. Vendor governance, what does their governance look like? What are they doing internally? Okay, uh, I was dealing with a company and uh, they sold a solution and they said, oh well, you know, one of the requirements was that the information that was provided in the system could never leave the continental United States. But their developers are in Israel. And we only scrub test data so much. So you need to know that type of information. How do you do that? Well, I mean, you can use NIST. Uh, you can use a number of other basic tools. Uh, what is it that you're going to build into your contract that basically says that they're required to give you some sort of attestation to their governance? Maybe it's um, you know an SA uh, SA uh, the um, SA 16 is it? <laughs> Now, it used to be SAS 70, SOC 2. Maybe they're going to provide that to you on an annual basis. Maybe that's enough. Um, vendor architecture, what's it look like? Are they relying on other vendors? And they don't necessarily volunteer that information. You have to actually ask it because a lot of times they just don't, you know, they don't see the risk either. So the fact that they're using an infrastructure as a service, you know, shouldn't really confront you in their minds. And, and sometimes when you ask that question, they'll be like, why? Why does it matter? Vendor lock-in. This one's important. So management's all stoked. They're going to put this out there. They're going to save all the different kinds of money and that sort of thing. And they don't have written into the contract how they're going to get that data back. And then they get the data back. They decide that five years the contract's up. They're going to roll everything back in-house. Everything's really looking great on the inside. Or we're going to move to another vendor. And lo and behold, this information comes back and it's in a proprietary format that you can't deal with. Fear not. The cloud provider will convert it for an additional X number of dollars. What are you going to do? You need to have this up front in the contract Basically saying, we love you, we're going to be with you forever. But just in case, how are we going to get our data back? What's it going to look like when we get it? And that needs to be built into the contract. Again, your vendor managers now. All right, so these are some of the questions you should ask. How long have they been in business? Who have they done business with? Do they know your business? No, oh, we've never actually done anything with you people, you type of people before. But uh, hey, we got the solution, we think it will fit. Do they understand, do they have an understanding of security? I put this in there because of personal experience, again, with the guy who didn't know what DR was. I also had another uh, conversation with another group that said, yeah, we follow, we follow uh, ISO 2700. So I said, okay, answer these questions. And I gave them questions on ISO 2700. And they said, where'd you get these? Hmm, okay. That could be a problem. 
Uh, do you have an understanding of compliance in your, do they have an understanding of compliance in your industry? Do they know that you deal with HIPAA data? Do they know that they'll have to sign a BAA? Do they know that that means that OCR can audit them? Will they be in business tomorrow? And that's a judgment call. You look at their finances, and you say, can you provide us with some financial records? Some are public traded, publicly traded. Most of the smaller ones obviously are not. You know, we need to see that you're paying your bills because, again, if you're on an infrastructure as a service or a platform as a service and you don't pay that bill because you can't, my data's gone. And I can sue you, but it won't matter because I may be out of business. Who are their officers? So depending on who I've been working with, like for instance, I can tell you that banks actually do like a background check on the officers of the corporations that they get involved with. So we would use something like Acleus or Acleus. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but basically it's a product out there that gives you a background check on these people. What, what are you looking for? Well, are they criminals? That's one. Um, and that sounds funny and maybe ridiculous until you've seen people that have basically come up with a solution in their garage. Um, are they involved? Is this the seventh company they've started this year? Maybe they've started 20 companies. Maybe you're okay with that. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a judgment call again. What are their internal controls and how are they assessed? And are you going to be able to see them? That assessment, preferably by a third party. Do they do vulnerability scans on their environment? Are you going to be able to see that? Is there any kind of remediation effort that goes on after they do those scans? So in other words, they give you their quality scans, they give you their whatever, Nessus or whatever, and you say, well, this is a problem for us. Do you have any contractual standing to make them fix it? I've had vendors where we've gone back and said, hey, this is a problem for us, and they basically say, tough. We're contractually not bound to fix that. And you just signed your contract for another 10 years. Oh, sorry. Again, audited by an independent party. Are they pen tested by a third party? Do they rely on other vendors? Again, I can't say that enough because you need to ask that question. Who will have access to your data? So this is about an internal control, which is basically, if I'm a platform, um, software as a service, obviously some of my admins are going to have access to your data. I'm on a platform as a service, obviously some of their uh, admins are going to have access to your data. On an infrastructure as a service, obviously some of their admins are going to have access to your data. So, when I talk about vendor management and I talk about doing that risk assessment for vendors, I am talking about every layer of abstraction. So, if you have that and you have all three layers, you need to actually do a vulnerability assessment on all three, or risk assessment on all three layers. Is it cumbersome? Absolutely. All of a sudden, maybe the cloud doesn't seem like a great idea for this particular data. Great for that data, not so much this data. Vendor uh, architecture, what is their deployment model? Do they have hypervisors with virtual machines on the hypervisors? Are they using an OS? Do they harden their hypervisors? Do they strip them down? Do they bare bones them? What are the protections that they have to keep backplane attacks from happening? A backplane attack, well, we'll talk about it in a second. Let me I'll get ahead of myself. Um, shared resources. So, what are the shared resources and what's the pecking order? What I mean by that is, let's say you contract with somebody to do cloud bursting at a particular time of year. And you're a medium-sized company, and you have a contract that says, we'll get this around November, December, because that's our peak ordering time, okay? But, they only have so much bandwidth, and they contract with a bigger client. And all of a sudden, it comes to November, and you go to Cloudburst, and they don't have room for you because the bigger client's taking up all their bandwidth. What's the pecking order? Am I guaranteed to get the bandwidth that I paid for? Or can somebody bump me? 
This is particularly important when you're dealing with companies that have uh, federal and state customers. Because federal and state customers almost always build in the right to bump everybody else off. What type of monitoring takes place? Do they have an auditing application within their environment that you'll have access to to basically audit a couple things? How much usage you have and those sort of things, but also how many times their admins are in the system touching your data. That should actually be separate. It should be a separate system and you should have access to it. Or you should be able to get reports from it and have some sort of comfort level that it's not altered. Where is the data and how do you know? So they'll tell you, well, our data's in Texas, but it's replicated to Rhode Island. But we also have customers in Ireland. What can you do to guarantee me that when something goes down, my data doesn't show up in Ireland? Even for a couple minutes while you fix a problem in Rhode Island or Texas. We talked about vendor lock-in. Do they use an open standard? That's usually what you want to have. You're using some sort of open standard so that when you get your data back, it's, it's usable no matter where you go. Metadata management. Is there an end of life agreement up front? Again, what's going to happen when the contract ends? Everybody talks about the great honeymoon period. This is going to be great. We're going to implement this stuff. What happens when it's over? How do I get my data back? What formats are going to come in? Uh, also, key management has to be encrypted. Who manages the keys on their side, and do I have access to that? So if I do need to get my data back, I can get it because I have the key. So we'll talk a little bit about key escrow and also code escrow. So one of the ways to mitigate some of this stuff, particularly with smaller vendors, is to ask them to put the code in escrow. So what that is is basically either giving you a copy of their application or having them give it to a third party, usually an attorney, so that if they go out of business next year, you can and legally have rights to that application so that you can download that onto your own server and use your own data again. That's something that you do normally when you have a vendor anyway but people tend to forget it when you talk about cloud vendors and particularly ones that are new. So if you're a service provider out there and you're thinking about going into the cloud and offering a cloud service, what I'm telling you are some of the things that will actually ease the security people's minds when you talk to them about selling your product. So the vendor selection process, the risk assessments, data classification, Vendor viability, again, architecture, layers of abstraction, their control environment, and the first round requirements. So this is stuff that all happens when you're talking to the vendor. And the requirements get built into the SLAs at every layer of abstraction. So what's your job as a security person at this point? Well, monitoring. Again, you're a vendor manager now. All you're doing is what type of monitoring can I do? What do I have access to look at? How am I going to look at it? What's the baselines? What's my remediation if I find that we're outside the SLA? This is something that was put in here. Actually, this comes from uh, the, the Cloud Security Alliance. Always plan for failure. What is going to happen to everything should the cl cloud deployment fail? If you plan from failure, then when failure comes, you won't be surprised. Not that I'm saying, I'm, I'm trying to paint a negative picture in that it's going to fail. I'm just saying be prepared and build from that perspective. That way your, your company can continue on. Trust but ver verify. So this talks about some of the abstractions. In the applications, the data, the metadata, the metadata, the content, let's start from the bottom here. The facilities, hardware, the abstractions, the core connectivity, we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. 
APIs, integration and maintenance, or middleware, uh, the metadata, data content, applications, APIs, presentation platform, presentation, I can't get that word, modality. Uh, we'll look at it on here. Yeah, the modality. So in regard to command and control, reliance on contract and SLAs go up the stack. Less direct controls go down the stack. So internal administration, vendor administration, when you're down toward the um, infrastructure as a service, internal, okay, internal administration, DBAs, users, vendors, administrations, DBAs, I don't know why I had that twice. The multi-tenancy, shared resources, shared data, hypervisor vulnerabilities. So uh, I actually know somebody who did a, who performed a hypervisor attack successfully as part of her master thesis. So she basically hit a, um, a platform that was set up to do this, obviously, it wasn't uh, any illegal activity. Uh, to basically plant something, and this is important when you have multi-tenancy because again, the application you're working with is only as safe as your, as your neighbors. So basically what she was able to do was to go through their web service or their website, attack a virtual machine, tunnel through that virtual machine into the hypervisor below that was managing other virtual machines, and then hack them as well. So know your neighbors. Whose other data is going to be on here with mine? So now you have an increased attack surface through backplane attacks and also because it's internet facing most of the time, uh, anything you have with Internet Explorer now is a vulnerability for the rest of you. So this talks about it here. So on this side we have a type one deployment and you have, a, you have the hardware you have the hypervisor and you have the operating systems in the hypervisor. And a type two hosted, you have the hardware, you have OS's, then you have hypervisors and then more OS's. And what I'm talking about when I talk about a high, uh, uh, backplane attack is just what I was describing. I attack this OS here, I get to that hypervisor, I'm able to tunnel. Hypervisors do not track traffic in between themselves. They don't know that the traffic is malicious. And there's no product out there monitoring that. So if I get to the hypervisor and I can get that hypervisor to talk to that hypervisor because they do, because they share resources, then I own every OS on that system. This one might be yours. That one over there belongs to some other company. Over there belongs to some other company but now I've pwned the whole thing. So what are they doing to harden it? You need to know. So this is cloud bursting. E-discovery, which we've already talked about. We've already talked about DRBCP. I told you I'd get ahead of myself. Increased surface attack, these are your vulnerability considerations. Browser vulnerabilities, encryption key management, mind the gap. Now, when they say mind the gap, you'll hear that a couple times if you start looking at, into uh, cloud uh, computing. Uh, mind the gap is that hypervisor attack. That is that backplane gap because it is not monitored. Compliance, monitoring, full data lifecycle. Again, build into the contract what happens when it's over. How are we doing on time? One minute. All right, we'll go real fast. <laughs> so the key things here is in regard to security, what you have to do as an organization is you have to train your security people to be more vendor management than they are right now. And there's training involved to bridge that gap. And I've thrown in, see I'm right on time, I've thrown in some miscellaneous models that are out there. These are the Cloud Security Alliance. Some of these are ENISA, which is from Europe. Some of these are NIST. Uh, this is the cloud cube, uh, cube model, also called the Jericho model. Uh, this is the vendor risk assessment model. This is up in NIST. 
the operations model, this is um, uh, from the Cloud Security Alliance. Some other models. All right, well, we talked about what was in short. And so here are the standards that you need to look at. Cloud Security Alliance, CSA, the security guidance for critical areas of focus in cloud computing, version three. Uh, ANISA, ANISA is from Europe and they put out a bunch of stuff on this. It's really, really good stuff. And on obviously NIST 500-291, NIST Cloud Computing Standards Roadmap, 800-141 guidelines to security and privacy in the public, in public computing. That's it, questions, comments, manifestos. Thank you all for listening to me today.